And actually, as this, is, uh, this last video was about the digital network architecture, I thought it would be wise to talk about digital or digitization, and actually to talk more importantly about what, the, what is the impact of digitization to a network architecture. What do we, as network builders, network designers, network engineers, and people that generally o operate the networks, what do we need to do to support the digital business? Now let me start with, with another confession, right? For a long time, um, and, and I'm working in the IT industry for already 12 years, and I'm 11 years at Cisco doing various technical roles. For a long time, I was sitting in, in your shoes and in your place at such conferences, and I was listening about digitization. And I actually sat down in, in, my, in my office uh, in one afternoon, and, and I actually thought, do you really know the definition of digitization? And I realized, yeah, it's a buzzword. Everybody thinks it's cool, it's sexy, but I don't know what is the definition of digitization. So what do you do when do you don't know the definition? You Google it, right? So I Googled the digitization, and actually I spent a couple of hours uh, looking at Harvard Business Reviews, looking at various articles, and I, I didn't like what I found. Right? I thought it was a bunch of buzzwords and, and mixed terms put in a, put in a structure uh, until I, I bumped into a publication uh, from, uh, of course, Swiss, a very fancy business school called Institute for Management Development, or IMD. And IMD actually published uh, a study on digital transformation. And they said, we don't know what is digitization either, but let's see who is successful digital business in order to define what is a digital business. So they looked at roughly 100 companies. And uh, they, they were all obviously successful in the 21st century, digital is savvy, embracing new technologies, having a bunch of young people. And they looked at a very, very interesting pattern. They said, okay, they all have, have their secret sources of success, but let's see what do they have in common. And it turned out that they have one thing in common, and it was the ability to create new paths and new ways to create customer value. So they did something massively differently than all of their competitors. And, and then IMD took a, a, a next step and said, okay, why don't we give this some structure, right? And, and maybe we are on the path to define digitization. And they said that those companies are creating new paths and new ways to customer value in actually three areas. And, and those are cost value, experience value, and the one you heard 1,000 times probably is the platform value. So, but for me, the most, uh, the most interesting one, and I was thinking, hmm, maybe this is something, maybe, maybe I'm on track to, to define digitization and to find the right way. So I always try to look at my life, right? If it works for me and works for my life, then probably I, I will accept the definition. And I said, okay, do I use what, what is this cost value thing? And actually, I found two good examples, and I tried to, to actually give you one picture that describes it. And the first example is a digital book, right? So IMD says uh, di new digital players are able to completely disrupt the cost structure of any business by delivering the same products, goods, and services at actually dramatically lower cost. And let's look at the example how, uh, how digital publishers, the, the most prominent one is obviously Amazon with, with Kindle, they, they stripped two-thirds of the cost of book production and the cost of book printing by actually providing digital books. And I realized, hell yeah, in the last eight years, I didn't buy a printed book. First of all, my wife would never allow um, another piece of furniture in our flat. And secondly, I realized that I was paying roughly 25 euros a book for a printed version. And I looked for this presentation. For the last five books I bought, the average cost was, was a little bit less than $10 from the Amazon. And so this is an example how digital player can disrupt a relatively established publishers. Uh, with disrupting the cost value. But let me give you a more extreme example, right? I, I'm based in Croatia, I live in Croatia, I love Croatia. 
I had a chance to spend some time in Switzerland in my life. So, and in the Deutschsprachigen part of Switzerland. So, I, I, I have a bit of a, uh, I, I know a bit of German. I came back to Croatia. It, it, it's kind of rotten pidgin German right now. So I said, okay, why, why don't I, why don't I take some more classes? Uh, I had Germany in my region. It's, it's wise to speak German nowadays as an IT guy. So I, I went back to, to study, right? And I, in Zagreb, if you want to get a, a decent professor to teach you uh, German for 90 minutes, it costs 200 kunas, which is roughly 25, 30 euros. And then uh, we went skiing, actually, and uh, I always ski with, uh, with friends from my, from my childhood and in, in Austria, and they were starting ordering some drinks in a very, very funny German, right? It, it's really... So I was pretending I don't know them, and I asked, well, what the hell are you doing? I mean, you, you guys don't speak German. They said, oh, we do, we do, right? It's this thing, Duolingo. It's fantastic, you see. I mean, it's the, the best thing you've ever seen. And actually, they were, they were actually able to, to learn a language, right, in, to the very basic level, though, but they were just using software. And, and I was thinking, okay, right, Duolingo will probably not get you where, uh, where a professor on a one-to-one -one lesson will get you, but, but actually software is disrupting uh, the, the usual, very, very traditional uh, teaching of, of foreign languages. So that's another example how, and of course, not to mention Duolingo is completely free. So digital disruption is, in my opinion, the most extreme in the area of this cost value. So whatever you do, whatever your business model is today, if it's not already a digital software business model, we all need to be very careful because somebody somewhere can very easily come with a completely new business model that will disrupt the cost structure of hardware business. They can find parts which are no longer hardware parts but are software parts. They can exchange people with software and they can completely mess up the way we price things, the way we sell things, the way we support things. Right? <coughs> Let me try to, to define another, uh, another two elements of digitization. Another example will be an experience value, which is the way how your customers actually enjoy your goods, products, and services. And I thought, okay, what is the, what is the example? And then I realized, right, uh, as a Cisco guy, I'm able to go to US, and you always need to bring free things from US, right? In Croatia, it's Uggs boots, it's Apple stuff, right? And it's Ralph Lauren clothes that is three times cheaper in US than it is in Croatia. So I'm pretty silent when I go to US, otherwise I'm getting 10 to 15 emails to, to bring those stuff back. Right? This time my life was again a little bit more difficult because it's no longer about Axe boots, summer is coming, but it's about shoes and it's about shoes for training. To be more precise, about the Nikes, right? So I didn't know that a certain significant other of mine was well aware that today you can buy custom-based custom shoes, right? And today, actually, there are black ones, there are white ones, there are fancy ones, but you can actually design your own. And, and of course, if you compare it to any shopping mall or if you compare it to the fanciest uh, fashion store in the world, actually online is now offering you to create your own shoes, right? I, I was trying to think for, about another example, but this experience value is completely changing from sell and forget to constant communication with your customers and constant reminder of how do you use the product. Think about your smartphones. Everybody has a smartphone in this room. And you just you bought a thing. You didn't pay too much if it's new because the cost is, again, think about the first reason, cost is going down. However, you also, with every software upgrade, you're getting something fancy, right? This is a, a U.S. example, but, but it's really a strong one. And, I mean, we don't drive Teslas in Ukraine and Croatia. I'm aware of that. But one thing really, really struck me, and it's, uh, it's actually the, the autopilot thing they got. So when you bought, you bought a Tesla, you learn how to charge it, you drive it, you probably ran out of, how do you say, ran out of gas in Tesla, I don't know, ran out of power, right? And then... Two years after, you just get the autopilot for free and you can start with autonomous driving, right? The reason why I'm bringing this example because I had the same moment of enlightenment with Cisco, right? When I was discussing 
when we acquired Meraki five years ago. And I remember San Sanjit Biswas was on stage and we were discussing about some functionalities of Meraki, whether people use it or don't use it, right? And they said, and I said, come on, nobody's, and we were discussing about certain types of authentication. And I said, come on, Sanjit, nobody's using this, at least not in Europe. And he said, I said, less than 20% of people are using it. And he said, actually, no, 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 39.4% people use this. And we know this, right? Because we're constantly looking what features and functionalities our customers were using because we want to serve them better. And we want the dashboard of Meraki to be not overpopulated with hundreds of menus, but we really want to put the right things on that dashboard. And I was thinking, wow, maybe this is, uh, this is really a new era and a new way to do networking. I won't spend a lot of time on platform value because I think everybody is pretty much aware how what is the exponential value, right? When you bring a lot of customers on the platform with a lot of offering, and obviously, the more customers you have on your Deezer or Spotify, the more music you have on it, it's better. And when you marry the two, the value goes exponentially up. Now, this, is, this was a good structure that gave me the definition of digitization, and I, I think IMD did a good job for me. So they said, not only, not only that there are three different business models that are usually changed, and if you want to read the publication, they go in much more detail. They give you five business models for every of the category. But they say the companies that really made it are called the value vampires, and they are the ones that are able to combine all of the three areas of how they differently create value for their customers. So. The, the bottom line is no industry is today safe. And, and obviously, some of the, according to IMD, some of, the, some of the industries are in the center of this vortex, right? And they call it a vortex because it, it pulls everything to the center. It's very chaotic, right? And it forces the industry, industries to even dissolve and recombine. And currently, we see this, right? We see this in technology, right? Software is, is eating the world. Uh, it's a quote for Mark Anderson, the, the founder of Ander, Anderson Horowitz, and the guy who actually invented Netscape, right? We see this in media and entertainment in, industry. I mean, who bought a CD this year? Nobody. That's right. I mean, who went to the video store this year, right? So, so these are some obvious examples where digitization actually already kicked in. Um, and if you, if you go and, and read further, McKinsey says 45% of jobs in the next five years will be disrupted by technology. I, I'm not saying they are gone, right? Although I do, have, I do have an opinion that we will need to work harder to actually, uh, to, to actually close that gap, but I think something big is happening, right? And digitization is just no longer a buzzword, right? And before I move on, I just, again, I say I test everything on, on my life and I put a slide, but I hid it because uh, I, I think it, it's more of a story. And, and I tried to look, okay, what is the impact of digitization of, on, on, on my life, right, in the last six months, and do I have any prominent examples, right? And because you feel this is not happening, you feel this is continuous, right? And then I realized in the, next, in the, in the last six months, actually, I, I, I stopped, uh, so I travel every week. Right, almost every week for Cisco. And I travel to Switzerland, I travel to Eastern Europe, I, I travel to CIS countries, I travel to US, and uh, pretty much that's it. So I had a big problem because my region covers 28 countries and uh, they have 22 currencies, believe it or not. Right? So you have two options if you travel into 22 different currencies. One is to spend roughly 500 euros uh, per year on uh, ATM fees, right? And another option is to actually negotiate with a, with a big uh, exchange office in Zagreb to try to get you all, all of the local currencies. And I lived for the day when I could and travel without any cash, right? Just taking my good plastic and, and going to any countries. Really, Uber changed it. And now in more, of the half of, in more than half of the countries, I really travel without cash in the last six months because uh, the taxis were the last resort. They were the stubborn ones not accepting any cash. Since this is pretty much available, I don't have, I don't have cash. Even further, I don't have a credit card because in the last six months, uh, I'm using an app, right, and I'm using uh, NFC, uh, which is now accepted widely in Croatia, 
uh, and I'm using actually a, a credit card on my phone. So when I go, I, I, I bike to work typically. So when I go on my bike, I don't want to carry any, any things in my pockets. So basically I'm, I'm well off with a phone uh, without any cash. So if you look at, think yourself, did your life get disrupted, right? Did you change any of the habits because of the digital disruption, right? Now let's go, let's move a little bit further towards the networking industry, right? And these are some data points that, that are in the, that are now, that we have a good definition of, of digital disruption. Let's see how our beloved CEOs uh, think what's happening and what they want to do. So for, the fact is, for now IMD did a study, they analyzed different industries, they put them in a vortex, and now close to 45% of McKinsey, they say four leaders out of 10 will be displaced, means they will no longer be leaders because of the digital disruption in the next five years, which is, I believe, after all, not such a shocking thing because new companies emerge. They used to emerge in the past. They emerge now. It's a dynamic world. However, <clears throat> it's very interesting to see the figure on the left because 45% of the companies uh, currently ignore this. And, and we always believe sometimes that we're maybe a bit better than we actually are. And actually, we see now the large portion of the businesses see the disruption or, or they know the buzzword, but they, they didn't dig into it. And they say, it's not happening to me. Right. As all of the bad things, it's not happening to me. 45% of, of, the, of the companies across verticals. 25% are proactive, have a strategy, have a person, have somebody strong in the organization assigned to the digital disruption and drive it. And, and I must say, traveling through the region, we see this pressure is pretty strong, in, especially in a very, very mature markets like Switzerland. This guy have a, this, these guys have CDOs, and they're not chief development officers, they are chief digitization officers. So we see a lot of move. And encouraging statistics, and, and this is from 2017, IMD did a study again, they said, okay, CEOs get it. 74% CEOs believe they will be disrupted. So they're panicking, which is good, right? The challenge is they believe, so that's step number one. Step number two is actually to find the skills and to find the right innovation in your company. That's the difficult part. That's the really difficult part. And now think about, let, let's go a step back and now think about this forum, right? It's, it's a digital network architecture forum, right? And we're currently in the world that is inevitable change. We're currently in the world where four out of 10 companies will be disrupted by somebody we don't know the name yet today. It probably doesn't exist today. It's gonna to disrupt in five years. And we see the leadership is waking up. So what I want to say, and this is my most important point today, is that we are the 6%. We need to wake up. We are the people, the technology people, the network builders, the network engineers that need to close this gap, that need to help our leaders, right? That we need to help our companies to become digital. And the way we do it, we do it from the network perspective. And let me tell you why. If I would try to describe uh, what I do to my son, it would be too early, he's just one year old. But in a couple of years, uh, when, when he asked me for the first time, what is IT? I'll say it's three things, right? First, it's users who connect through the network to the applications. It's, it's a very simple thing. In the end, you're a user, you have a smartphone. On your smartphone, you have applications. Right? On your PC, you have applications. The network is the glue in between. That's it, right? Another thing, if you are a CIO, you can do two things, right? You can build or buy. You buy cloud services or you build things on your own. And this is the paradigm in which we are operate, operating in a very, very simple words. Now, when this digitization started to happen, let's see how do we transition, okay? It is, uh, again, back to, to square one, very fancy wording, uh, everybody talks about it. Let's give it some structure and it's really about a business. It's really about how we change the business models. So in, all, in order to, to digitize the business, so let's see what are the touch points with the network. And the, and the touch points are, in my opinion, four important touch points that really prove that digitization is coming to the networking world. And these are places and trends that we see for the last three to five years in the networking industry that force us to, to react. And these are mobility, these are cloud, these are internet of things, and these are the emerging threats 
as we are seeing security more and more important because we move more and more portions of the business into the network and into the digital sphere. So <clears throat> let me just give you an example for mobility. I think that uh, the inception of smartphone changed forever the way we do networking, right? If you look at uh, before overwhelming usage of smartphones, you had corporate devices. They were like soldiers, right? Uniformed, same OS, same software version, give me your PC, I'm going to patch it, you're not going to use it until I patch it. Well, then, then Mr. Jobs came and, and disrupted the industry a little bit. And basically right now you have a, a, you have a terrible zoo to manage of end devices. You don't know what kind of device I'm, I'm having. You don't know if I got one for Easter. You don't know which software versions I'm running, right? And you don't know if I'm surfing on any you know, dubious websites during the evening so that you know, I might pick up some things and come to, the, come to work next morning. So the challenge is on us. The edge of the network is becoming increasingly important because it's the place where you define the policy and it's the place where you are defending and when you are actually doing the border control for all of these mobile devices. The second big thing happened, that happened to us is the cloud. And the cloud has two realms. It has the realm of the data center, where it means first, as I said, the, the dilemma of every CIO became build or buy. And to be able to decide whether I build or buy, I first need to know what I have. It means I need to have under control things like shadow IT because marketing people don't want to talk to me any longer because I'm a stubborn old IT guy who it takes ages to do everything. I have this security policy. They just run their campaign of the cloud from an app I never heard of. That's a problem, right? That's a problem because they violate security policy and the security guy just came back from the conference where uh, the new GDPR, uh, General Data Privacy Regulation, comes into place. And my company can be fined up to 20 million euros or 4% of revenue if we screw up things. So you see there is a conflict happening in the company, amidst which are we the IT people. So the cloud needs to be managed and you need adequate insight and adequate analytics in order to see first, do you move to the cloud uh, from the economical standpoint, from the technical standpoint, from the security standpoint, but sometimes you need analytics to see if you already moved to the cloud and you just don't know it. Yeah. Internet of Things. Also, let me just, so I, my background is I started as a Wi-Fi engineer and I'm in love with channels 1, 6 and 11. I did a lot of RF things in my life, etc., etc. But suddenly they pushed me to talk about analytics before, because Wi-Fi was not just how do people connect, but actually just take an example of this uh, group here we can have a decent analytics on an aggregated level, of course, how many people are in the room, how many people left the room because my session was boring, and we can have some good statistics about what is going on, how long people stay, etc., etc. Retailers really use this, right? But this is no longer just about Wi-Fi. If you buy a Cisco access point in the last 6 or 12 months and you go for high-end stuff, you're going to find a Bluetooth chip in one. And Bluetooth chip has the capability to do so-called virtual beacons, right? Which exchanges all of these things that you put to do, not just analytics. Here is the interesting thing. If you have Wi-Fi, yes, you do analytics. You count the number of people in the room. Great. Then you go to, to, to really fancy retailers or to the hospitality, to five-star hotels. And then a marketing person will come and say, do you do proximity marketing? Uh, what? So proximity marketing is a fancy word for something where I'm moving with my smartphone and there is a zone which is probably a wine cellar in the shop and you could find me there easily. And um, basically, if you go there, right, you would, a Bluetooth beacon would recognize you, say, okay, somebody is in the proximity and if I have a loyalty application or if I have my browser open, I will get some context messaging, obviously, to buy some good wine, cheap wine or, or fancy wine, whatever. But the point I want to make is with Internet of Things and with new technologies, be it LoRa, be it Bluetooth, and I just took one example, we are really opening up. We are opening up in terms of number of devices. We are opening up in terms of 
complexity of that. We are opening up on the application layer because we need to manage that, we need to analyze that, and we are opening up for security breaches as well. Right? So this is the big important trend. And we are expecting 50 billion devices on the internet until 2020. Not all of them will be Ethernet or Wi-Fi. Right? There are going to be different technologies. And important is to have a vendor that is ready to support you there, right? As I said, I don't want to spend time on threats because they come with a package. So these are the four trends that dictate how the network needs to look like, right? So let me now do a little bit of a historical walk through how we built networks, how we build networks, and how we will build networks in the future. And basically, think about your last project, your last RFP three years from now. Yesterday's network was very simple. It needed to work. And you would probably list 50 features, um, but it comes down, your network needs to be performant, it needs to be reliable, and it needs to be secure. So we look at an, uh, authentications, encryptions, dot one x yes, uh, maxsec, yes. It needs to be reliable, link level redundancy, system level redundancy, blah, 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 right? Performance, one gig to 10 gig. So actually, our job five years ago was, my network is working, don't touch me, right? Am I right? right? <laughs> so, and our lives were beautiful, not to say. However, now we are on the spotlight, right? And we are on the spotlight already today. Networks of today are the networks where somebody from the business will come and say, give me something, right? And you will say, but my network is working. And they would say, OK, your network is working. Just give me something I need. And typically, they will come up with its four requests. Right? And the four requests of networks of today, first, the, the one from yesterday stayed. It needs to work. However, right, we need visibility. And visibility, I already shared the example of, of Wi-Fi analytics. right? So retail people will come to you and say, tell you, how, can you use Wi-Fi actually to tell me how many people entered the shop? And can you tell me? Can you tell me why the shop in Kiev is working, working better than the shop in Odessa? And can, we tell, can you tell me why the people stay longer in this shop? Right? That's interesting visibility. I spoke about the visibility in the data center, where actually you can move from the traditional access list way of looking at things. With Cisco ACI, you can completely flip it upside down and say, okay, this is my usual policy. I'm moving from blacklist to whitelist to say, this is the normal norm of communication, and I'm going to use this, right? Another, another example I think I already share is from security to compliance. Yesterday, you would have a port 549 open or closed on a firewall because you know why. But today, there is a new regulation coming. And you are not talking to people that are from IT. You're talking to auditors. You're talking to a CFO who says, somebody told me that we can pay up to 4% of our revenues. What the hell is going on? Uh, do you have that under control? Are you sure you have that under I mean, I'm looking at you. You should have that under control. So we, as, as a vendor, we need to help you guys here to actually do that. And it, to do that, this is not difficult. It's difficult to do this with the abnormal deadlines. It's difficult to do this with this pace of change. And it's very difficult to do this with quality and, and, and in a short time. This bottom part of the slides is my favorite, actually. And flexibility and programmability are something that really fired up the whole industry, right? Data center people got it five years ago. We, as networking people, it took us a little bit longer to develop these concepts. But now, flexibility. And when, when I say flexibility, I mainly think about the deployment models. Today, you have Mobility Express from Cisco that is actually a solution for 10 access points or for five, five access points. And you, ha you can set it up and running in five minutes, right? We, we range from that to, to thousands of APs for largest enterprises to the most complex networks of the world. So today, if you're a small business, you need good, good price, you need cost, and you, know, you need simplicity. If you're a huge enterprise or a service provider, you will need much more complex stuff. We need both. You need it on premise if you want full control if you want full compliance, and you need it in the cloud, if you need ease of management, and if you need simplicity, and if you lack IT stuff. And programmability is the most important thing. If I may ask you one thing, please go to the net DevNet piece of, of this conference and, and check out. Cisco has so many open API, and we invest vast 
crazy amounts of money to actually make everything open. Now, I will move a little bit to the, to the principles, how we want to build networks in the future, right? And I, I will show you all of these principles include everything we built has to have open APIs, right? Network of tomorrow is nothing more than a continuation of this journey, right? And visibility and analytics will move to the business analytical insights. So this will be expectations from us in the future. The different deployment models and how users and networks behave is something we're going to need to measure in a, and we need to show to the business in a, in a very near future. And the networks will be fully automated. In three to five years from now, I believe we can talk about a complete autonomic environment and something I would personally call a self-driving network. So a good question is, why not today? And what is stopping us to actually get there even, even earlier? And this evolution is basically crippled to a certain extent with overwhelming complexity. And here are the 10 examples what is, what is complex in the current environment. And let me just take the analytics piece. And today, if we talk about the analytics, analytics in the data center is not the same thing as analytics in the campus. In the data center, you would look at, do I have enough capacity? Did I allocate enough memory to this application, right? Do I have too many VMs per physical box, right? Do I have the adequate storage, the, the right type of storage assigned to this, right? On the other hand, I as a user, and let's assume I want to check in for my flight tomorrow, and let's assume the airline mobile application is not working. I really couldn't care less if they have the right VM or if they use the right storage or they have enough memory. So analytics in the campus is something that we want to get from the user perspective, not from the, not from the networking perspective. So back to the analogy of the airline application, we bought up dynamics just to solve one problem for our customers, $3.7 billion just for one problem. And that problem is, if my airline application is not working, how do I know that you cannot check in using my application. We give this visibility into the real time right now. And we give this visibility with respect to the complete business process. So that's just one example. In the data center, one set of solutions, one set of problems. In the campus, completely other, right? With Wi-Fi analytics, completely other. It's a pure marketing retail story that we need to provide. So there is, I could go for every of these 10 elements and, and share with you how amazingly complex it is. And today, if I would need to point out one reason why Cisco is the good partner for IT in the future, it is because we are aware of this complexity. We are the player in all of the relevant fields, at least we believe so. So we are your partner to reduce complexity and we have a roadmap to digitization. So we understand the network is not there any longer just to work. We understand network in the future is something to support your business, something to support your leaders, your CEOs, your board. And for that, it's very important to start with defining the strategic battlegrounds. You can't tackle it all. You cannot, from the network perspective, now run 20 projects to digitize the business start with the three crucial battlegrounds. And this is, again, take my realm from users, connect to network, which serves applications. Where everything connects, both users and devices, is the edge of the network. It's number one strategic battleground. Where applications are born is the data center. And if you have the infrastructure without humans, it's pretty much useless. So we, we need to look at how everything collaborates and how we as people use the network and the tools to collaborate to spark up this innovation. Right? And if you think about uh, Cisco has the solution today. Right? We are defining our business. We are defining our architectures with these three things in mind. We have one more important thing, which is effective protection and security built in the network. Right? I recently see, and you, I'm, I'm sure you will see this picture on this conference, and I think it's a pretty cool picture. 
especially for Ukraine, because the, it's a plane that is stitched of 50 different parts, right, representing uh, obviously 50 different security vendors that form your form your security strategy. And the, the question is, would you fly with a plane? I'm, immediately, I'm thinking about Antonov, right, which is the most most powerful thing in the world. Question is, right? Imagine if it had 50 colors on it. I believe you wouldn't get that much orders. Um, the thing is, we believe that security as well needs to be a platform, right? And you need somebody who, who can take a step back and have a look at a campus, have a look at a data center. Just to give you a couple of examples, ISC, Identity Services Engine, is a policy from campus to branch to data center. Analytics, we run from data center to campus to, to, uh, to location analytics, etc. right? So Cisco has three simple solutions. And it's DNA for the edge of the network and for the campus. It's FARC as our new collaboration platform, which is software as a service, completely new meeting experience. And it's ASAP, automate, simplify, analyze, protect for data center. And what is really important that this is a platform, not a product approach. We cared about the hardware mainly when network needed to work. Now network will work. But now we need security built in the network and we need the platform. So everything we will be building in the future, be it DNA, be it campus stuff, be it data center, be it collaboration, will have security built in and three principles. It needs to be simple because we know complexity is your biggest issue, right? We cannot, we as Cisco people cannot follow the innovation that's happening in the, in, in the industry. It's damn difficult. It needs to be open. Please go to DevNet, and if, if you can get one takeaway from, from this uh, forum today is about how many open APIs Cisco has. Do you know that you can integrate Spark to your website and ask for remote assistance on one click? There are so many things in this world that can be integrated already, and this is gonna grow. And last but not least is automation. We're gonna be automating from provisioning, to deployment, to maintenance, we're gonna automate more and more things so we make it easier. Still two thirds of the cost for network is operational cost. It's not the, it's not the hardware, it's not the gear, it's not the software, it's, it's the work we put in. We want, to, we want to make it easier. So let me dig a little bit deeper in building the right infrastructure, right? So principles of our differenti differentiation are no longer going to be speeds and feeds and gigabits and throughput and encryption and features. It's gonna be analytics and insight we offer on our platform. It's gonna be automation and agility we provide. And it's gonna be security and compliance, right? And, and the same way I try to dig a little bit deeper into the digitization, right? I want to show you what does it mean. Already we have a NetFlow for greater insight. We have the tradition analytics, the most deterministic way of analyzing the data set. We have App Dynamics and CMX that I already talked about. In terms of automation and agility, application centric infrastructure, APKM, these things can offer you great automation in data center and campus, right? We can roll out 300 branch offices in the matter of minutes using APKM instead of doing the endless stack rules. And security and compliance, think of TrustSec, think of network as a sensor. Those are solutions that are already in the market supporting this digital realm of the business. Now, we also put a spark into the user experience and we try to move the collaboration platform to the cloud, right? So we built, uh, in January, something that is cloud-based, world-class connected hardware, all of the video endpoints you know from app to, desk point, to desktop to room, but we also redesigned the meeting experience, right? And, and we also, as I, as I mentioned already, Spark has the open API, so it, it integrates into to your business process, right? So let me switch gears now, and, and this is pretty much the content I wanted to share and, and to to show you how this platform is relevant for digitization. But I believe in real projects. I believe in things we already did. But I also know that big companies usually come up with a bunch of fancy case studies from US or from Western Europe. So with a little help of demo gods, right, and they taught me, you do it and then it works. Um, I wanted to, to bring something with me, right? And as I'm from Croatia, I think there are some pretty cool projects 
that we did in Croatia. So I asked one of my fellow colleagues uh, from Zagreb, who will be with us virtually on stage in a couple of minutes, with the help of the demo gods, of course. But I want to ask you a question first. And, and the question is, if anybody can recognize what is this place? All right, thank you very much. Right. It, it is uh, one of our pearls on the Adriatic. And apart from making it, it beautiful, we wanted to make it a little bit smarter. Right? And, and I, I really wanted to point out two projects that are close to my heart, right? and, and that are really projects coming from Croatia, which, which suffers from, I think, pretty much the same problems that, that you have here. And, and uh, basically, we, uh, we have a slow public administration. It's, it's not always easy to drive these things, but I wanted to bring these two projects because I want to show digitization is real, even in, in, in our countries. And uh, with some luck, we will get Vedran to tell us in just a couple of minutes a little bit more about these two projects. So he's going to sit in the office. I hope he didn't fall asleep. Actually, I know because we tested this, of course. But let's hope in, uh, in a sec he will be here with us. Dobro jutro. Good morning, Kiev. Kako smo? I cannot complain. Good morning to everybody. So, uh, let me introduce to on stage virtually Vedran Hafner, our fellow system engineer from Croatia, who, who is actually a mastermind behind these two projects, right? And uh, I, I just, uh, I have a couple of minutes for, for you, not more. So, could you tell us uh, what, what did you do in Dubrovnik, actually? So, what, what was the problem, what is the project, and what are the some outcomes, really quickly? Well, I don't know how much you know about Dubrovnik, but it's a rather small city with a big traffic jam during summer. So basically they have a parking problem, traffic problems, because the uh, amount of tourists in the city uh, are hugely out numbers, the, uh, the amount of people usually living in, in the city. Also what they figured out is their electrical bills for, uh, uh, for their lighting is quite huge as everybody else. And uh, as every other city, they, they care about the environment, so they would like to uh, take care about environmental data on different parts of the city. So they approached us with this request and they asked, can we solve it somehow? All right, so um, what, what are the elements that, that we have installed there? So if you build a smart city, what do you actually do? Well, you can do different things. I can tell you what we did. We, we had to start with something. So we started with the, uh, with, with the first street where we deployed uh, underlying network. It's, uh, we decided for wireless simply because then we can use it for tourist guest uh, access. So then we deployed smart lighting, uh, which is taking care about how many, uh, is there anybody on the screen so you can dim the light or undim the light. Uh, we implemented uh, smart cameras, which are counting the amount of traffic in the parts of the city, and we also integrated the uh, ground sen parking sensor so we can in the real time know uh, what amount of free parking slots in each area uh, we are covering. I also, we implemented environmental sensors for uh, humidity, temperature, air quality, and other indexes. Fantastic. And so, any first feedbacks? Well, the first feedback is at, uh, from, from the municipality side that, that they have now in the background Cisco Digital Platform, which is collecting all this uh, information and providing them statistical information, not just once a month or once a week or uh, whatever they did in, in, in the past. It's a real-time data uh, provided to them. And then they said, okay, now we can plan really uh, and see what's happening. But they opened it up on, uh, through APIs to the third parties. So now any company can build an application which will use the free slots or uh, parking slots information in their application for whatever they want. So they're quite happy. They are looking for a funding to extend the city uh, to a city-wide uh, project. Simply, they figured out if you're doing it together with lightning, you can finance it just from electrical bill uh, savings. Uh, okay, that's fantastic. And another one that is probably close to both of our hearts, right? He has three boys. I have just one for now. Uh, but actually, we 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 looked at the education, right? And we all know it's a, it's a challenge. And the biggest challenge we have as, as parents is 
how do we actually equip our kids with all these sensitive things, right? And how do we do this? Because when, when they go to school, um, it, it, in Croatia, it was pretty much, you would find everything the same when I, like when I went to school, right? And uh, we, we had a really, really good partnership with, uh, with our national research network. And I really wanted to ask Vedran, uh, what do our kids get when they go to school eventually? So, as you said, we started this project with Croatian uh, National Research Network, CARNET, and uh, we, we decided for this top-down approach because you, you need to do more than just technology to, uh, to do it. From the first day, we are aware that this is not, this is the least technology problem. It's the biggest, uh, I would say, uh, uh, cultural problem, how we do things as we do it uh, uh, all the same. So, what we've done, uh, we've done we, we decided to build something which is called Digital Readiness Index, the index where we are measuring how school is ready or not uh, for the new era because our kids are not learning the same way we are learning. They, they go to internet or to YouTube to dig for data and they, they have it all the time at home. They need to have it all the time in, in the school. So uh, I have uh, one fortunate or unfortunate that my wife is a math teacher in the school. And then uh, I tried to consult with her and I said what we can do, you can, we will get best of breed wireless you can trick this, trick that, I'm engineer in my heart. And then she said, are you crazy? And uh, why? And she asked, do you know how many IT professionals on average is in each school? And I said, one or two? <laughs> Zero. Zero IT professionals in each school. So you will give us best of breed technology for which I need an expert to configure, and who will do it? Then we rethink the whole project and we said, okay, you're right. We cannot do it that way. We will just drop the technology to nobody. And we decided to go with Meraki. And uh, at the end, Cisco part of the story was full Meraki story, I would say. So how, how, how far did we go, right? I know it's, deployment, it's in deployment right okay. now. So how many schools are meraki so far? So uh, at this stage, we delivered in 50 schools. We are not right now delivering the contract side and the uh, delivery is uh, ongoing in 130 schools because you need to do cable and get everything yeah. in the school. You don't have any, anything uh, in place. But it's not just about network where Meraki is providing uh, great wireless network switches, MDM and URL filtering on MX. It's about smart boards also. In each school, there is at least one class with a smart board. It's about tablets you deliver. It's more about curriculum because we built in the project uh, the whole curriculum uh, for STEM uh, uh, curriculums, meaning for the last two years in elementary schools and first two years in uh, high school. So it's about uh, e-grade books, so everything is digitalized. So it's more much more than, than, than a network. But we are targeting at this moment to be at, in three months from now at 10% of the schools. Uh, then we will measure them for two years and see uh, what's working and not, and not working. And then we would like to, in two years from now, extend the project to 50% of the schools. That's, that's great. That's really, so, so Vedran, um, th thanks a lot for, for tuning in to, uh, into Kiev today. Um, thanks for your great insights and uh, I mean uh, really thanks for sharing these uh, two things that as I said are close to my heart and I think are a proof point to, to everything I was uh, saying in the last uh, couple of minutes so with that we're gonna let you do your work right and uh, I'm gonna finish uh, my talk here uh, so thanks a lot for tuning in and uh, have a great day see you tomorrow bye have a great conference bye So I, I, I picked these two examples, and I know you can't hear a lot for, from this couple of minutes, but, but really we wanted to show a couple of, couple of projects we do when we do it all, all across. Right? I, I'm uh, pretty much supporting countries way smaller than, uh, than Ukraine, right? And we wanted to show that we see now these things are really happening, and that they're happening in the verticals where they never really happened before. But we really see there is a strong driving force for such digital environments where it never was before. So to conclude, basically what I said today was that digitization is real. It's, it's hitting every industry. It's gonna display, uh, displace half of, the, half of the leaders there. 
And the overwhelming complexity is stopping us to actually fully embrace it as, as the network people. And to do this, we need to have a strategy. And our strategy consists of these three digital battlegrounds. To, and we need to, to, fight, to, to try to fight to enable seamless connectivity in the campus networks. We need to deliver controllable scale in the data center. And we need to ensure the seamless, frictionless meeting experience and collaboration, right? All of that is completely pointless if we don't have the security embedded, right? So in order to support our businesses, right, and in order to be a digital partner to our businesses, we need to rethink the way we build networks. We need to think more about the platforms instead of products. We need to think about the visibility, compliance, flexibility, and programmability that we deliver today. And we need to think about the analytical business insights, behavioral awareness, and complete automation for the future. If we are able to do this, we're going to tremendously help the digital future of our companies. And we need to help them deliver personalized customer experiences. If you recall the beginning, right, it's experience value that matters. Enable the workforce innovation. We, as the IT people, need to spark that up. Today, CEOs believe only 6% of companies have the, the thing to drive that innovation. We need to help them with technology. We need to optimize the business operations and, and actually come back to that cost value and see how we can be the disruptors and not to be disrupted. And in the end, we must not forget about the risk because if you are moving to digital, you need to digitally protect the digital. Therefore, if we are successful, right, we will be good partners for, for our digital business. So let me close my talk with, with four key takeaways, right? Don't be afraid, endorse the disruption. Disruption is here whether we like it or not, right? We need to challenge ourselves and our companies and the way we do business, and I hope over the last 45 minutes, I was able to share with you that Cisco is happy to be disrupted. Cisco embraces disruption and we are completely rethinking the way we will build networks for you in the future. Define your battlegrounds, right? Start small, but start precise. It's the edge, it's the data center, it's the collaboration that are the good starting points to start thinking about network as a digital enabler. Prepare for the transition, right? It needs to work, of course it needs to work, but it's about software and it's about business outcomes that this software enables. Think more and more about that. And finally, I want to ask you to spend a great two days with us to enjoy this DNA forum and um, please, please have a look at the, at, the, at the wonderful conference area where all that we spoke about this morning can be tried, seen live, tested, you're going to see a Meraki demo, you're going to see the DevNet stuff. It was my real utmost pleasure to, to talk here in front of you. I hope you have a great conference and I wish you fantastic two days with us here. Thank you very much.